Christine. I work uh, at Atlassian, um, which if you're not familiar with Atlassian, it's a software company based in Sydney, Australia, and we make software for software developers. So um, if you don't know Atlassian, you might know Jira or Confluence. Those are our two big tools. Um, so most of the documentation that I work on is for the um, end users, so less dev docs and more um, end user front end type documentation. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit today about um, how I've changed the way that I do documentation based on the collaboration that I've, I've had with our design team. Just a quick survey, who here would put their put designer in their title? Would you consider yourself a designer? <laughs> okay. That's good. No one can call my bluff today. But, uh, <laughs> does anybody work with designers or UX uh, people? Okay. Okay, more people. Cool. All right, so um, so uh, our design team at Atlassian has uh, grown quite a bit. So when I started at Atlassian about two years ago, we had maybe five designers or so. And today we have probably closer to 30. And this is because the Atlassian overall has really started focusing on um, improving our user experience in the product. So we really want to focus more on um, how users uh, feel about our products and provide a really happy, nice, um, great experience for people. And not just for the super tech devs that come in and are fanboys of Jira, but for the casual users that we're trying to you know, just reach out to and be um, more accessible. On the other hand, uh, the tech writing team traditionally has played um, more of a what you consider the stereotypical role. Um, we're a pretty small team. We have about 10 tech writers at the moment and around 400 developers. So we're very lean and we, it's very easy for us to kind of get into the mode where we sit at our desks and we're just madly updating documentation as we're shipping features. So it's hard for us to sometimes break out of that and think about how we're going to help users um, and think and think about it in their shoes and less about, you know, think, instead of we're just, you know, talking about how awesome the feature is. So as the design team started ramping up and we added all this focus on the user experience throughout the company, we realized that the goals of the designers and the goals of the tech writers are really one and the same. We were just coming at it from different angles. So we were all trying to reach users and trying to give users a really great experience in our products. We were just using different words and different tools to do it. So we started collaborating a lot more closely with them. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Some of the things that we got out of it and some of the techniques that the tech writing teams actually stolen from the designers and use every day. So um, just to quickly go through, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because this is a little bit more dry and it's really just about our, the experience that we've had um, ourselves. So I wanted to spend more time at the end talking about techniques that maybe everyone can use, whether or not you have a design team. But this is just some of the things that um, we've gained from our design team. So our design team has established some design principles. This is the latest version. They've been through a few iterations. But I just took this picture three weeks ago before I left the office. So they probably, hopefully, they're still the same today. <laughs> but um, they have three design principles. And the goal of design principles is to um, bring the focus um, from what we're doing and get it out of the day-to-day -day and the grind and really think about the higher level things that we're wanting to achieve um, with our software and with our products. So the design principles that we have are be familiar, grow with me, and give me clarity. Um, so the, the um, like for example, these are pretty clear, but these are what really drive the decisions that our designers make when they're prototyping a new feature or um, figuring out how to fix something. Um, one really interesting one is the Grow With Me. It's really about helping empower our users, figuring out uh, to um, become more efficient with our tools or to get better, become power users, or just to figure out how to use our tools so efficiently they can go home quick at the end of the day. So these are what our designers work towards. But we realized we could really adapt these for documentation. All of these are really good goals to have as tech writers. These are things that we want to achieve as well. So when we, we work and we make about we make we think about our big decisions that we want to make when we plan a document and we work to these principles because these are good things too for us. So we're all working towards the same big goals and then how we translate in that into the documentation plan or the way that we write topics differs. And we can work with our designers and our product managers and our developers on that. But we're all working to these high level goals as to how as to how we can um, better you know, advance humanity with our software. If you don't have design principles or designers, 
it might be worth looking at some. Um, I, these are three of my favorites. The Android is actually my top favorite design principle, and they've done a really nice job of presenting them beautifully and making them engaging and capturing things that you really want to do um, as just a human being to help others, other humans. Um, so if you don't have design principles, it's worth giving them a look and thinking about if you can apply them to your documentation and apply them to the way that you work every day. Um, it helps get you out of um, just thinking about a feature and really thinking at a high level what you want to achieve. So we also have personas that our design teams created. The personas have been adapt adopted um, throughout the company. So if you, and personas are a big project. Like we always kind of talk about in theory, personas are really valuable. We should all be thinking about our personas. Um, but a lot, it takes a lot of research to come up with, with good personas. Our design team uh, did about a year long project to do hundreds of customer interviews and then develop these personas. But what they came up with were four personas that we think use our products and that um, everyone in the company can relate to. So they actually, this is a picture from one of the Atlassian bathroom stalls. So there's a persona poster in the, every, every Atlassian bathroom. So everyone has learned the personas by heart. <laughs> so when you're walking down the hall, you can hear people talking about Harvey, our persona. How can we reach this person? And that's developers, that's marketing people, that's us, it's everyone, because uh, we all know these personas. So it's easy for us to kind of have common ground for how we make decisions for our different customers. So just to briefly talk about this, um, somebody asked a question yesterday about um, measuring our, our documentation and measuring how people are reading our content. And this is really hard. We don't really, I think technical writers always struggle with this. We always have a hard time figuring out if what we're doing is valuable and the works we're writing are good and effective. Um, and we haven't figured out the answer. But we've gotten a little bit better um, through the pairing that we've been doing with our design team. Um, one of the ways that we've gotten better is we have some actual data, some quantitative things that we actually know about our users now because our designers spend so much time interviewing customers, um, running quantitative testing with them, doing usability tests. They have a whole database of all these customer interviews. Um, that's like gold for technical writers, right? We all need to know what our audience is. So when we started talking to our designers, we realized, oh my God, you guys have 100 customer interviews about this, how they use this feature. This is amazing. So if you have designers in your company, and maybe if you don't talk to them that much or haven't really reached out, it might be worth seeing what kind of data they have access to uh, that you wouldn't normally have. We've also had a lot of success talking to our designers and, get, and collaborating with them on organizing customer visits. We probably are at least one customer side a week, maybe more. Um, so it's a really good way to get actually in front of our customers, sit beside them while they work, find out what they do when they first open their computer in the morning, and how they use our products, what their challenges are. Um, and if you have, uh, if you pair with, another, with other people and other teams, there's a lot more, um, you get a lot more uh, um, traction to get customer visits scheduled. Uh, so the data or the measuring side of this is the usability testing that we've done with our designers. So they are de they prototype um, features all the time, and they usability test those prototypes all the time. Sometimes those are um, paper prototypes, but a lot of times they're more high fidelity. And a lot of times we have customers that are willing to come into the office and do um, prototype tests with us. So one thing that we've realized is that when our we have people coming coming in and testing uh, new features. It doesn't, we can sit in with those in those usability tests and we hear what the questions the customers are asking. So we're getting a list of all the FAQs that customers have about a feature. Um, what do they ask as they're going through a process? What are the trends in the problem areas? How, if we can solve that in the, in the feature, then that's always ideal. But if not, that's pretty much our documentation plan, right? We already we know immediately what customers are gonna need help with when this feature goes live. Um, the other way that we've been piggybacking, uh, the other way we've been getting some measurements is uh, to piggyback on analytics events. So we have quite a few analytics events that we add to every new feature that we ship. And we have uh, people that are just, whose jobs it is to analyze the events. So designers are using the analytics results to see how customers are um, using a feature, if they're using it as we expect, how they're um, going through the flow, when they drop out of a process, um, and to sort of validate assumptions that we've made. 
And we can do the same thing with the documentation. So especially if we have, say, links from the UI into our documentation, we'll put an event on and see when users are actually going to the um, documentation, how many people are struggling, how many people need help. Cool. So now I want to spend more time talking about uh, design techniques that we've uh, learn from our designers and have stolen and used all the time in our tech writing teams. Uh, yeah, so can we do a little quick workshopping? Yeah, can we grab the whiteboard? Awesome. Uh, cool. So these are all workshopping techniques that you can do as a, as a group. So I thought we might do real quick mini one. Could I have four volunteers? You don't have to talk, you just have to write. There's one, two. Not you, you work here. <laughs> one from this section, one from this section. You don't have to talk. There's one. Maybe Christoph will give you chocolate. <laughs> There's one. Awesome. Okay. Do you guys know each other? So, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So let's. Uh, so empathy maps. This is the first thing that I want to talk about. Um, this is a way to kind of understand more about your users and really connect with them, um, feel their pain, and understand um, how it is that we can reach them. So um, I think we, I want to do a real quick workshop where you guys fill out the empathy map. So the way an empathy map works is you have your persona in the middle. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then you have six quadrants. I want to make sure I write them in the right order. So you have here, think and feel, see, um, and then down here we have pain, and we have gain. So what you do with an empathy map is you fill out, you list things about whatever given persona and that they would uh, that fit into these categories. So since we all have sort of different, um, we're coming from different backgrounds, we don't have a lot of common ground, I thought we might um, use Eric as our persona. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah? Cool. I protest. <laughs> Have a good one. Take a stack. Yeah. Thank you. Have a marker. Your beard is me. to workshop and figure out how we can help our users in the documentation and in the products. 
So one, one thing that we do with empathy maps is um, do before and after. So we'll figure out um, what the before state is. Um, for example, we did one with a sysadmin. So we know that before we help them, sysadmins might hear a lot of complaints from frustrated users, or their pain points might be that they never feel like they know what features we're shipping and they feel inadequate at their jobs because they can't explain things to users. Then we do an after map of our ideal state, how we want to help those people. Um, and one thing that we came up with for our sysadmin example was um, we want them to feel empowered and we want them to empower their users. So we actually had this really cool idea come out of that exercise where we, um, we decided that we could send some training materials to our sysadmins that they could then distribute to their users and then they wouldn't feel that pain of feeling like they're out of the loop or like they're bad at their jobs. Um, so it kind of really helps spur ideas for new solutions as well as just getting you in more thinking about your customer and you know, putting yourself in their shoes. Um, so if you're gonna, so some of the things that we've learned about uh, using design techniques is investing in post-its. We use post-its all the time. Uh, it's actually really hard to find post-its in Budapest. Maybe I just don't know where to go. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, and then when I asked about post-its, I don't think they understood what I was asking for, but anyway, um, we use post-its all the time, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I kind of thought it was a little bit cheesy when the designers always carried around a big stack of post-its, but it's, they've really won me over. One reason is because as you're working, it's really easy to move around ideas. So if you, if you come up with a brainstorm session, you can then categorize things, move them around, come up with um, groupings that make sense for you. They're also really fun to get like collaborating on ideas. Um, you guys doing okay? It's okay. So that was one of my points. So uh, if you come, if you're working, collaborate. you can collaborate. And if you have, duplicate ideas, just stack them on top of each other, or make like uh, sub streams or branches. Time's up. Okay. All right. We're good. Yep. Thank you. Everyone, give them a round of applause. Cool. Oh, thanks, Christoph. <laughs> okay, so let's look at what we got for the empathy map for Eric. Uh, lots of things about thinking and feeling. Oh, worrying about attendance rate. Um, thinking you might be out of time. Thinking about building community. Uh, sees lots of talk proposals. Sees design for swag, the venue space. Uh, gains dog awareness and gains new friends. So this is a uh, great job, guys. So this is um, a list of things. Do we all feel a little bit more empathy for Eric? Like thinking about all these things he was thinking about? <laughs> um, but you can see if we were going to write some documentation for someone who's going to design a conference and work at a and, and put together a conference for next year, we kind of have some ideas of things that we should cover in the documentation. Like, oh, we need to give them some tips for when they go see the venue. Here's some things that they need to think about, some things to consider. Um, oh, pain, AV, so that's a good one. So these are all things that um, if we needed to sort of like come up with a book for how to how to put a conference together. We have a bit of an idea of the pains that someone's going to experience and how we can help them and the specific things that we need to address. So anyway, um, a great summary that is that about my post-its uh, slide is that it's really fun. It gets people up, it gets them talking, um, and it's very collaborative. So it's better than just if you're working on a PowerPoint or, some, or maybe Prezi, I don't know. It's hard to move ideas around when you change things and everyone's looking at a screen. So it's very, um, can be a little dull and dry just to map things out on, on an on a, a application. So when you do things up on a board, it gets your brain working and gets people talking and gets them up and out of their seats. So it's a great way to collaborate and brainstorm. Another thing that we've taken from our designers is sparring sessions. So when our designers do sparring, um, they, look at a prototype for a new design and they print it out on a big on big pieces of paper and they stand at the wall and they critique it in group. Um, I printed up at the goals of the sparring session. I stole them directly from our internet. Um, these are for the designers to assure design quality by critiquing design early and often. 
to drive toward, toward outcomes and decisions quickly, and to keep each other in the loop and learn from each other. These are all really good things for uh, tech writers as well. And we needed, we realized that we needed to kind of leverage each other's skills and get better about sharing our ideas and uh, being more consistent in the documentation that we work on. So we decided to start running some sparring sessions on our docs. Um, so what we do is before we do a sparring session on a piece of documentation, is we send out a draft, or um, we send out a draft for people to review, and we also send out like a brief or an outline of what it is we want to focus on in the sparring session. You realize this is pretty important because when you get a bunch of technical writers in a room, they can tend to critique a lot of things and go for a long time. So there can be a lot of talking about spacing or phrasing and all that kind of thing. And that's fine if that's what you want to get at a sparring session. But sparring sessions can be a lot more. So for example, we run sparring sessions um, to evaluate how well a document uh, supports a specific audience, like an admin. We've also run sparring sessions um, where we looked at a piece, uh, looked at a document from a different company, and we really liked the way that they did that documentation, and we tried to borrow those principles and incorporate them into something that we did. So we did a sparring session to evaluate how well um, that draft held up those principles. So it's a really good way to get group thinking on a design um, and to get critiques going. If you do run a sparring session and want to try this out in your team, here's a few tips that we've learned the hard way. Uh, time boxing is really important. So uh, like I mentioned, tech writers can talk for a long time and come up with a lot of um, input. Time boxing, uh, like if you have a couple things that you want to cover in a session, set a timer on your phone and go for 10 or 15 minutes and then end it. Um, similarly, if your team's given to negative, being negative thinking or falling back on that, that type of um, critiquing, do positives only five minutes where you just look at the document and say the positive things about it, the things that you think really work or the things that are really good. And this can also be a really good way to get started sparring. Um, if you're not really sure how to, if your team's unfamiliar with the concept or a little bit hesitant, it's a good way to um, sort of bring that focus on positive things because the positives are just as important and can be just as valuable to, to call out as the negatives. Um, also, if you have quieter people on your team, it's not a bad idea just to put their name down on a list and, make and check off once everyone's been heard because there's always those loud voices that can kind of cover um, other people's ideas up. A good sparring session, the writer will leave with three action items that they can go investigate. Now the onus is on the writer to figure out whether or not they want to incorporate the feedback, um, but they can, it's their job to go off and research and then make a call about whether they want to make changes that were suggested. Uh, so this is another so, uh, workshopping idea, sort of uh, sketching type exercise. I think there's going to be a lightning talk about sketching later, so hopefully we'll be aligned. Um, this is a, a great way to sort of figure out new ideas for new, or new solutions. Uh, so uh, the way a six up works is you take a big piece of paper. Um, in the States, it's like 11 by 17. I'm not sure what the A4 size, what the A size is. But you grid it off into six. And then you use each square for a different idea. Um, and then you draw the idea. So this is a challenge for technical writers and for developers as well, because when we do this with both of those types of people, they like to write out the idea in, wo in words, um, which is understandable. But when you draw it, you really focus more on the customer experience and what the user is going to see. So we did six ups to um, come up with a way, a new way for um, users to search our documentation. Well, how do we ideally want them to be able to come in and search? So six ups really help us figure out, okay, what should the page look like? What do we want them to be able to do? Um, it's a great, if you do six ups and you're trying to come up with some new um, ideas for solutions, it's a really good to do it in uh, a group exercise. Do one five minute session where everyone does as many ideas as they can and focuses on the same problem and then do a quick presentation, and then do it again. And you'll be amazed at how many um, people can build off of each other's ideas. Um, things will come, themes will come out, and uh, people will build on um, things that they've seen in others, and you'll get some really awesome solutions. Uh, okay, user stories. So I think designers coined this term before they started working with agile developers, because it's a little bit misleading, but what it's about is figuring out the way that users are going to go through the flow of a product. 
Uh, so what, when, we're, when designers are prototyping a new feature, they'll print out a page for each screen and put it up on a design wall. Uh, and then they'll put up a page for each single click and each single path a, users will go, a user will go through. So this is something that designers do already. They do it as part of their sparring. They do it as part of their planning. We started getting involved in this process because we'll go and we'll um, talk through the design with the, with the designers, the developers, our product managers, um, and we'll talk about where are users going to have problems. At what point in this process are they going to falter? Are they going to have questions? And how can we support them in the documentation? So we're, we talked about we talk about this term falling out of the flow. So when you, we have a we have a flow a story mapped out on a wall. We look at the point where we know users have issues, like is it setting permissions or is it doing some kind of complex configuration? And this is where we think users are going to fall out. And so we know that that is where we need to provide documentation to support them and to get them back into the flow. Um, the other great thing about user stories is that it makes it really clear how users are going to come into a process, like what context they're going to have when they come in, if they're going to come in from a very controlled uh, set of steps that we know exactly what context to put in the documentation. If they come in from a lot of different areas and they're coming in to use a process um, for a lot of different reasons, then we know we have to provide a different type of context and documentation and cover a lot more um, scenarios. Uh, and then this also helps us figure out what users are going to do next. So if you work with DITA, then this is kind of like mapping out your post recs and pre recs for you. We can also do um, use post-its for user stories as well. So this is a more low fidelity type uh, exercise where we I map out what we think users are going to do before we actually get to a real prototype. Um, you can see in this uh, picture, we actually use different colored post-its. And we, yeah, the yellows were for um, admins, I think, and the blues were for end users. And what they do in each point of the process and where it's different. Um, we can build on this idea with uh, we, a lot of times we'll map out a flow and we'll talk about where people are going to have problems and we'll use voting mechanism to say here's where we think we need to focus our efforts um, either for the fixing the product or for documenting um, because we like things that stick together we use like little colored sticky dots to vote so everyone will get five or ten sticky dots and can go vote on the things that they think are most important uh, and then you can build out your documentation plan based on the, the problem areas. And in Australia, I learned that DOCO is like the Aussie slang for documentation. So there you go. It's free for you. Free for you to use. Okay, so let me just wrap up quickly how we got to this point of using all these post-it notes in our documentation <laughs> plan. Um, we met, we ta started talking to designers that were really keen on the things that we were doing and the ways that we were that we could work together. They saw value in documentation, um, and they saw the ways that our, our goals overlapped. So we started working together, and, and, that, and that really led to a lot of collaboration, and it led to us being, workshopping things together all the time. Um, then we started trying it out on some projects. So we started bringing in developers and saying, hey, we're going to write an empathy map for this user, this feature. Come with us, and let's try it out. Um, we had the most success doing this in projects that are really um, lean. So projects that are pretty happy to try out new things and fail fast um, and then recover. So that's, that's where we kind of had the most traction is people that were willing to give this kind of weird new agey post-it notey world a chance. <laughs> this is a good way to go, get started. Uh, the other thing that really worked well for our developers is to do it on projects that um, are data driven where we're running a lot of analytics events that we could actually validate some of the things that we were assuming or that we were getting out of our sessions. So saying when we mapped out our user story and seeing where we think users are going to exit, if we could back that up with analytics events, it was a real win and people really started to get involved and understand, oh, okay, prototyping a whole user story can help us figure out the right things to do. Uh, so if you're interested in sort of expanding into this, uh, here's the my quick guide to getting started. Uh, Read about some design principles online. Think about how they could apply to you and if they could help you um, bring some a new focus to your documentation or to the, what you're working on. Uh, read about design techniques um, and read some UX blogs. So I, now I read quite a few design blogs. Uh, some, of the ta some of the blogs are pretty boring and sometimes they're ones that I just skip if they're talking about colors or things that I don't really care about. 
But a lot of times they talk about really great ideas, like new workshopping ideas that we could try or um, things that we could try to pull into the planning session to bring more focus on the UX and the docs. And finally, at the very least, um, this is a pretty easy thing to do, is to write a documentation experience plan or include a documentation experience section in a doc plan. And this is just, this doesn't talk about outlines, it doesn't talk about topics or uh, linking strategies or anything like that. It's all about figuring out what the experience and what the feel of your product's gonna be and how you can support that in the documentation. Uh, there's my contact information. If you wanna uh, reach out to me, I'd be happy to talk to you about anything. And that's it. Any questions? for maybe one question. So you said uh, you learned lots from designers. Do you think that there's anything that designers can learn from tech authors? <laughs> so I think one thing that the tech writers do really well is we tend to be closer to the products and we have a better idea of um, the technical limitations that are, are the reasons that you can't do something. So designers tend to think very kind of sky. We're like, oh, we could make this amazing page and then the users will have no problems. But I think we're very good at sort of that bridging the gap between um, what reality is and what we want it to be. Uh, so I think we help sort of ground them sometimes. Thank you. Cool.